and we're live to review uh, a special episode of Blake Seven, one that Jeff quite likes. Um, countdown. Uh, for, That's what was special about it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> because as of late, uh, they've not really been uh, knocking out the high grades. Uh, no, no, I think there was one not that long ago that I liked before this. Yeah, I think it was Pressure Points. Maybe Trial. Yeah, the Trial one was alright. Mm. Yeah, this was definitely an improvement over the last week. Yeah, that was Hostage, written by Alan Pryor. Uh, right. Uh... Now, Alan Pryor wrote a load of stuff for TV, so it's not like I'm putting the boot in. Uh, so he was a very successful writer, so it's just that his stories for Blake 7 weren't the best, in my opinion. Uh, and actually, seeing a, a fan's list of the, uh, of the highest reviewed episodes, a lot of his episodes are towards the bottom. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I have to say, before you read the summary, that I figured out, without even having to look it up, uh, which Doctor Who the guy was from, I mean, the uh, Grant, the guy from yeah. Grant, he was, yeah. he was Duggan in yes. City of Death, yep. I figured it out. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I figured not to mention any of this kind of stuff, never to say anything like, hey, Jeff, you might recognize someone in the next... Yeah, no, that's cool. I like figuring out for myself because I knew I recognized him and I knew he had he was in Doctor Who, but I, you know, I was trying, I was sort of had that in the back of my mind, thinking, was he another one that was in Genesis? Because several of the people from that have been in Flick Seven, so I was like thinking about that, and then it came to me, no, wait, I know which one he was in. So just as a general rule, and just to check, like, no little teasers, nothing like, watch out for, just like, want it a complete surprise. Well, yeah, it's better that way, I think. Okay. 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 I just, I just figured I would uh, say that first, so, so you can, you can tell us what happened and. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I read this out. Um, this is in the book Liberation. Uh, although, if people want a fuller, yeah, a fuller, a fuller synopsis, will be this book by Tony Atwood. Uh, what have we got here? Countdown. Yes. The planet Albion is a Federation colony, but strangely only a small force of Federation officers is present on the planet to control the entire population. Revolution is held at bay by the Federations having primed a solium radiation device, which if definite sorry, which if def detonated will destroy all life but leave buildings intact. A revolution has taken place, nevertheless, and the device is activated. One Federation survivor, Space Major Provine, attempts to escape by using a rocket especially provided for for this eventuality. And you'll have probably noticed that the rocket seems to have been reused from previous episodes. Like Time Squad and Deliverance. You know the one that blew up with White Wax Sun? Ensor Sun, isn't it? Ensor Junior. They seem to have reused that prop quite a bit. Uh, read a bit more. At the moment of the revolution, Blake, Avon, and Villa have teleported to Albion, searching for Provine in the belief that he can inform them. It's, oh my gosh. Inform them of the location of the central computer control system. However, when the Liberator's crew meet the Rebels, led by Corda, they try to help by investigating the mechanism that controls the Solium device. Avon discovers that the, that the detonation device is not itself within the Federation complex and could be anywhere on the planet. Orak is used to pinpoint its location inside one of the polar caps. Avon then meets Grant, a mercenary who has been helping Corda organize the revolution and recognizes him as an old enemy. However, because of Grant's expertise 
it is he who teleports with Avon to the polar cap in order to attempt to dismantle the device. Meanwhile, Blake searches through the ruins of the Federation base and meets Provine, whom he is forced to kill. Although Provine informs Blake that Central Control is now called Star One, and gives him the name of the one man who knows its location, a cyber surgeon called Dockley, he fails to disclose any further information before he dies. Avon and Grant work to deactivate the radiation device, but are hampered by faults in the structure of the building in which it is housed. They have switched on the heating system, starting a melting process which causes large amounts of ice to fall into the room. Grant is trapped and injured by a falling beam. Avon nevertheless succeeds in deactivating the device with just one second to spare. It is revealed at this time that the dispute between the two men originates in Grant's mistaken belief that Avon left Grant's sister, Anna, to die at the hands of Federation torturers. Avon explains that this is untrue and that he in fact loved Anna. Their differences are reconciled and Grant chooses to remain on the planet, helping the Albion populace build a free society. Do you think that covered it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think this episode demonstrates how much better overall the story seems when the bad guy is not an idiot. Yes. Yes. Because I mean, Morgan and I both mentioned multiple times that, you know, they had somebody who was believable would be in this position because he actually seemed to know what he was doing, you know, and didn't do all the TV tropes of giving away everything he was doing and and uh, having to give some long speech before he shot somebody so that they had plenty of time to overtake him and things like that, you know. <laughs> so everything about Provine was really believable in terms of. Uh, you know, it, it added that more suspense as to what exactly, how how far he was going to get and what he was trying to do because he was so much better at, at a, you know, staying alive and, you know, I, I think one, smart decisions. <laughs> I think one of the reasons why t that, that sort of uh, forced upon Terry Nation is the logic of, well, he's one guy against everybody else, so if only I'd be smart. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, you know, they. I thought the, the tension with uh, Avon and Grant was, was played really well because they had that, you know, sort of uneasy alliance, but, you know, there was still that, um, you know, well, tension, like I said, between the two of them and, and Grant kind of holding the grudge about what had previously happened and only at the very end kind of, getting to the point where he was, you know, could forgive him, so. I mean, as a, as a story idea, it's pretty simple, but very well done. And, and, yeah, and what I've said repeatedly, and that in my my taste and things is very much that those are often the best stories, is is it doesn't have to be a super complicated plot. It just, it's better to have a simple story that's just well executed. That's what I think this was, it, you know, it, very, very few periods of, very few lulls in it. You know, it, it maintained the, the interest, uh, interesting stuff going on, the suspense of what was going to happen exactly, and, um, you know, that was effective the way that they brought it down to the last second, and it didn't. They didn't cheat with having, you know. Oh, it's 30 seconds, but then it actually takes like three minutes of actual showtime for 30 seconds to go by. <laughs> you know, they really did do it in, in pretty close to the real time, so that made it more effective, too. Uh, I'm just nervous. I mean, Terry Nation's good at making things difficult. But like in Pressure Point, he made it difficult for them to get into the Federation Central Control. Or what they thought was Federation Central Control. And uh, in this one, you've got the, the fact that they've got the device and it's moved somewhere else, and they, the way they have to break into the safe, uh, the difficulties that they put in front of them. Uh, and the, interestingly, they use sodium in the pilot 
of Battlestar Galactica. Where they, they said, we're looking for a solium leak. And he goes, Captain, Ap Apollo, Captain, that stuff's dangerous. So um, that was in the uh, saga of a star world. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so what I've got some... Uh, Yeah, yeah, um, I made some notes here. Uh, I'll, I'll now do the share screen of... Uh, I've not done a, an enormous number of uh, grabs, but I've got some. Uh, here we go. So we've got... And uh, feel free, Jeff, to comment on any image that takes your fancy. Oh, yes, this guy. Yeah, my first comment, I think... In well, other than Morgan and I both mentioned something about explosions, but I think the first comment was that uh, they made it to Scarrow because you had uh, you had these guys looking like the Khaleds from Genesis of the Daleks with the all-black outfits. Now, this guy here looks like a better-looking version of this guy. Do you know who that is? No. It's Mark Thiessen. Who is? Speech writer for George W. Bush Jr. No, George W. Bush. Okay. All right. I just thought he, I just thought he looked like him. Um, now the thing I, I remember thinking was that the, that the guy, the major, looked a lot younger than the guy he was ordering around, so I, was, I actually thought of something <laughs> you had said about homicide when you mentioned that the... the uh, captain you know was younger than g so it was kind of an interesting dynamic of the yeah. you know the young guy ordering around and his elder and that same thing that same dynamic was present here with the older curly haired dude the only thing i didn't like about this episode it's not to do with the scripts i thought the corridors were terrible hmm. <laughs> they were some of the tackiest and like I said, it was heavily unionized at the time of the BBC. It's just like the people the people making the sets. I mean, the set designers must have been tearing their hair out. Thinking I that, guess it's a testament to uh, the strength of uh, the action of everything that I didn't really notice too much. So. I mean, uh, Again, I think it makes a difference when you have a story that's compelling. Mm-mm that those other background things don't stick out as much as when you have an episode where where the story's kind of lame, like the last one, and then you notice all of the things that are mm. flawed in the in the design and stuff. Um, I took this grab, folks, because this shows what the cameras were like at the time where it would you would get streaks on it, where these are the sort of cameras they used in the 1980s where you would, would it would leave streaks on the camera, anything bright that moved would like leave a streak uh, on the camera and that changed in the 1990s in the UK anyway. Uh, Nostalgic because I think about when I was a kid and I had a night light in my room and I used to squint to make the light do that because mm. that way it looked like it was a star. Ah, right. So, yeah, just one of those little nostalgic and things from childhood. You, do, you don't like the lobster costume. <laughs> You know, the red, the red lizard skin. Yeah. <laughs> I actually thought, though, that this is probably one of Blake's better outfits. Yeah, it's in, like, uh, Avon and, and Jenna changed back into lousy outfits from previous ones. And I like the color of the thing that Jenna's wearing, but the, it just needs to, they need to get rid of the uh, goofy, like, uh, um, silver suns or whatever they are on the thing. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I thought this, like, fitted him... Yeah, he looked fine. Quite well. Showed his arms off quite well. Um... Yeah, if anything, I was just sorry that uh, the Provine, uh, you know, his, uh, his death was believable and everything. I'm just sorry to see him go because he's been the most competent Federation officer they've had yet. <laughs> yeah. Would have liked to uh, have seen him, uh, him come back instead of Travis. <laughs> yep. Uh... Yeah, that's why I took this grab, folks, to uh, emphasize this thing about... Uh, so, now we know we are, it's called Star One. Uh, 
Uh, it was a little spoiler that Jeff heard on the on the audio. Yeah, uh, I mean, I haven't been able to sleep since then because I was such a <laughs> massive, um, right. you know, knowing, knowing that, I just really can't, uh, you know, enjoy the show anymore. Sorry. Because uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I think he can tell them. I definitely them. didn't already see that title on the screen when there was a recommended videos that fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now they have moved, so, okay, so we've done that then. Uh... Well, they've moved it to, we did that. Uh... Oh, yes, I thought at one point Paul Darrow had a cold on film from his voice. Maybe so. Early on. You, you're usually better at picking up these things than I am because you're very orally sensitive. Yeah. Um, I was going to say on the title, you know, I pointed out that the last episode had a title that shared shared a title with with homicide episode this episode countdown shares a title with robotech because there's a robotech uh, episode called the countdown too uh yeah I've got some more of the corridor sets coming up uh yeah terrible this actress wasn't winning any awards i was about to say she was really the only weak link in those yeah. uh in the in the rebel force or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Well, that was uh, well staged. Uh, I think one of the ways Blake has quite a bit of presence about him, and uh, I would have to know like where the actor Gareth Thomas grew up, but you know he is a Welshman. Uh, yeah, I was thinking, as I said, uh, certain lines that, you know, even though he's trying to, he's doing sort of the, you know, the proper accent or whatever you want to call it, uh, there's only a few times where he kind of says something that doesn't sound like it, and one it was the way he said anything as in a thing. <laughs> what, 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 the actor like, playing Blake? Yeah, so I noticed oh, that. Interesting. Yeah, so Gareth Thomas is a very Welsh name. And uh, it is true that uh, Irish, Scots, and Welsh are tough. That is true. Every um, single one of them. Yeah. There's not a weak one in the bunch. <laughs> but it's a generalization. It is like a, <laughs> it is like a Celtic temper thing. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't just say it's an Irish temper. I'd call it a Celtic temper. Right, and this is where you, these. This is what I mean, folks, by the sets. It was just they were just very badly made. It was like some uh, like a school production. <laughs> hey, we uh, uh, we put on some pretty good school productions back in my yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, but not only that though. I mean, this was made like five years after Genesis of the Daleks, directed by David Maloney, and they. Overlit. I mean, when you've got a crappy set like this, don't light it so much. Hide it a bit. <laughs> and then you've got the lobster costume or the lizard. Well, it's kind of consistent, though, that the Federation um, doesn't spend much money on their facilities. Yeah, it's a bit like the <laughs> Eastern... So this is what I mean. This costume fits in well because he was a little... He was concerned about his weight, Gareth Thomas. And... Uh, this, that fits. That suits him well. Better than the silly gull wings. Uh, oh yeah, and again, frequently I've heard you and Morgan complain about the usefulness of <laughs> Squirrely, but you know he's good at opening things. Yeah, yeah, he has. He did his um, every few episodes reminder of why he's there. Yeah, <laughs> the old magic's still there. The old ego too. This thing. This is the thing. Do you remember this being reused? Not really. Well, do you remember when the in Deliverance, where at the beginning, that the, it blows up and there's a, and it has um, Ensor's son on board, on board, Ensor Junior. See, there's another connection uh, to Homicide because um, Ned Beatty was in a movie called Deliverance. Ah. 
There you go. <laughs> yeah, but I mean this, uh, and I think this was repainted and used in uh, Time Squad. No, it's probably a good thing that I don't, you know, that it doesn't stand out to me, you know, that that they reused the, because I'm sure there's probably several things, including the corridors you've talked about, that have been just repainted slightly and used in different episodes. So. Do you, Do you like the color of this? This thing. No, not really. No, I quite like the color. Well, then you'd probably like living where I do, because uh, that's close to the color of Texas A&M's color, so that we see a lot of it. <laughs> oh, do you not like that, Tim? No, I don't. <laughs> oh, I can hear that in your voice. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, I told you before that I, I'm, I'm always a contrarian, so, you know, grow up in a place and I don't want to be... Uh, not a fan of the local team. Ah. Though I have at times been uh, a fan of um, fairly close to local teams. Right, so, so other as, as we'll say in the, when we do the, uh, the maximum power thing at the end, when we go through the comedy book, Terry Nation, Terry Nation Street, certain things uh, come up again. Uh... Like radiation. He loves a bit of radiation, does Terry Nation. That's why I made the comments when they got to the point where they were talking about that the radiation would all be gone after they yeah. after they came back. I said, no, it's Terry Nation. The radiation, somebody, it's going to linger. Somebody will get radiation poisoning. Yeah. <laughs> right. and so, that, so that explains why they've got that little rocket that goes, that would go into orbit while it... Uh, you call him... Terry Radiation. <laughs> mm. Yeah, Terry Radiation. <laughs> is is the prodigal son there? Would he join us? He shot me. He did that. I mean, sometimes he would like he, he like he, he he went a full Shakespeare on this. He went a bit theatrical in this when he said. Things are more important than people. That like he really uh, emphasised the T and the P. And in one episode, he really rolled his R's. Yeah, it was like um, a Doctor Who episode where Barbara says something. Something has been going on for yars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not quite the way when I try to say it. I sound more like I'm doing a pirate voice, but. I can't quite imitate that. Oh, uh, I mean, we're talking about vowel sounds. Like Americans, when they did the American Theatre Standard, when they say um, last, the way Lorne Green said last in Battlestar Galactica at the end, it's like halfway between lost and last. It's not a weird kind of vowel sound. Yeah. Uh... Well, that's kind of like um, New England. Accent. Yep, that, yep, yep, and that's it. That is what American Theatre Standard was created for. It was it was to be like a theatrical version of that region. Yeah. Just like. But that's this, why I said uh, like there were people in the Doctor Who fandom that would pick on um, on the actress that played Perry on Doctor Who for you know her American accent not being good, but. Honestly, when I rewatched the her introduction, I said it's actually a pretty believable accent because not only was she from Northeast, but she also her family had traveled all over the place, so she had right. and she had gotten kind of some influences from various different places. So I don't think um, the fact that she uh, would say certain things in a more so the the problem was not her accent. The problem was sometimes they would write phrases for her to say that. I've never heard an American. Yeah. So the problem was not in the in her performance; it was in the writing. <laughs> yeah, she said that in the um, those Doctor Who handbooks, Jeff. I recommend that to proper Doctor Who fans, uh, because there a load of information. That, I remember that was the first one because there weren't that many stories Colin Baker had. He had the fewest number of stories in proper Doctor Who. Uh, he had more episodes than. McCoy, but he had fewer fewer stories, and so 
they covered it, that uh, doctor in quite a bit of depth. And uh, in the interview with Nicola Bryant, she talked about that, that uh, writers would make errors with the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So do you think the actor was quite good at being intimidator? Which actor? Uh, Gareth Thomas as Blake. Mm, he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't seem intimidating to me. But I mean, well, I guess he could be to certain other characters, I don't know. I mean, these days, he would have bulked up. Yeah, I like lines like that, waste any more time, you won't be getting any older. Yeah, I mean, that's really the, the only thing that's you miss much with Gan not being around, is he was sort of like the only one who came across as being the, the tough guy. <laughs> There can be other. There the other effect. The mo, the most effective characters on this show are the ones that come off as being the smarter, shrewd ones, mm. like Avon and and um, you know in this episode Provine and people like that that are actually like thinking and you know can can adapt on their feet and stuff, as opposed to there being people that are just out muscling others. There's not a whole lot of that being effective because most of the Federation guards are. As the Brits would say, rubbish. <laughs> Although it does give them the key information at the end. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wondered about that. Where, you know, it's uh, whether he would have just skipped it. But you know, I guess there's a part of him that might have um, that might have actually been rooting for him at that point. He's like, you know, hey, maybe, maybe I'll, my, with my last breath, I'll say, screw the Federation. Hopefully, he yeah. succeeds. <laughs> It's called Star One now. Where is it? Dockley, cyber surgeon. Only Dockley knows. Where is Dockley? Right. Then you see, uh, yes, Favon plays himself. Now, this, folks, is called the Duchenne Smile. Where when somebody does a genuine smile, we get these little you get a little, this muscle around the eyes activates. And so you get the, the full creases around the eyes with a genuine smile. Now you can actually do that and uh, you can give a genuine smile by thinking a happy thought when you're doing your fake smile and then it will have the Duchenne reaction. Ooh. Ah! Right, so what did you think of it, Morgan? He thinks walk away playing with coins. Okay. It was better. Much better. It was actually kind of good. <laughs> See, I didn't think it was stupid. Um, now, if they dragged it out any longer than it was, it would have gotten boring, but I thought it, at the length that it was, it was pretty effective. Still. Well, that's fine. As Ben has said, um, I, I, I uh, care more about relationships, so... All right. Yep, uh, we've got the the Avon Dell subplot that uh, gives it something extra apart from the action adventure. Uh, we've got some information on the arc plot in that we now know that Control is called Star One and about the cyber surgeon Dockley that they're trying to find. Yeah, I think what made, to me, what makes that so effective between him and Grant stuff is they didn't overplay, again, I've said before, like, the, they've done a good job most of the time and not, like, making it too melodramatic, you know, they didn't have yeah. these, you know, scenes with, which a lot of shows will do, where they'll turn on, you know, to some kind of violin music to try to, you know, manipulate the audience, get them emotional, and then they'll have a character be like, you know, you could have saved her, but you're, you know, just overacting, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
and they didn't do that in this, which, you know, it's better because it just, you know, it doesn't come off like they're trying to uh, force a reaction out of you. Mm. Uh, right then. So, here we go. Maybe the highlight of the video. <laughs> the Maximum Power Book. I'm thinking Paul Shelley might have been somewhere in Doctor Who, too, because that's the name sounds familiar and his face looked somewhat familiar. So maybe I, I haven't solved that. Uh, I'll, yet, but. I'll have a look. I mean, I have a book called The Universal Data Bank. It lists all the... No, is it Tristan? No, here it is. The Universal Data Bank. It's a book written by John Mark Leficier. And it's uh, this book. Let's see what we got. We got so this lists everyone who's been in it. I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, was that the terrestrial index? <laughs> well, I think that's all stuff, isn't it? Well, you don't need to waste uh, the video time looking that up. We can do that later. But um, yeah, I was going to say I I was predicting before you even get to the comedy book, like one thing they would make fun of because they you know the the somewhat um, uh, homoerotic innuendo between uh, <laughs> between uh, Avon and uh, and Grant in the scene where they're in the thing because he keeps saying things like we can widen the hole and get a rod in there and and they get really close to each other <laughs> several times so oh like, yeah I know they're gonna say something about this <laughs> yeah we got it there I mean right so uh, I'll let you. Uh mention whatever takes your fancy on this on the screen yeah i thought of that when i saw the thing where he says something about get your hand in here because there were several lines that were <laughs> that were you, kind of usually it was robert holmes who would put in stuff like that where he would like the old story was he would put in all of this stuff like stuff that he knew would be taken out and some of it got through yeah like in, like in his scripts for Doctor Who, he would always put loads of innuendos in. Yeah, well, and, when he, Avon was said like something about, uh, I just need an, another rod or one more rod or something like that. And I, I just imagine Eric Idle saying, like, I'll bet you do, I'll bet you do. And it's just like, and like, of course, most of them would, would be taken out when Robert Holmes put all these innuendos in. But, uh, but some of them, I don't know. Now, when I read this, it was by the time I got to this point is when I laughed. Yeah, it, obviously it, I don't get any of that. So, <laughs> because what happened was is I realised that they were describing the the um, it's it's like a there's a quiz show in England called Countdown, which is a bit like Scrabble. Oh, okay. And they have like thirty seconds to like make a word. Right. Okay. Well, uh, there you go. That paragraph there you might be some to go with. <laughs> yeah, the karate bits. Like Morgan actually said, it was probably the best fighting that they had had on the show so far. Yeah, Paul Shelley, I think that's Provine, isn't it? Paul Shelley, yeah. yeah. Right. What does that mean? Fringe is a bit daft. Well, daft means silly. Well, his hair, the fringe is his hair goes all the way forward. Oh. And that's called a fringe. All right. It's a bit like helmet hair. Hmm. Well, it just all comes well, forward. Well, he did wear a helmet at certain times in the episode. <laughs> yeah, it's just where the hair comes all the way forward, and it's sort of like it was. It's, it's a bit like this. Uh, it's like when they would do that thing where one of those old jokes, or they would like to put a, a bowl on a kid's head and then cut it round there, and see all the hair coming down yeah, there. Yeah, kind of a bowl haircut. Yeah. So the hair doesn't go in the eyes, yeah. 
and the fringe is just that bit. Anyway, we'll get back on the a little bit like I tell you, who had a heat a fringe. He man had a fringe. All right, I don't think we need to spend any more time on that. But um, what is perspex? Uh, plastic. It's transparent plastic. It like Orac. All right. Yeah. I mean, Morgan mentioned how much it looked like Orac. The, the green make you queasy? No, you probably just ignore it. Uh, a job lot. No, it looked more like real military outfits. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the countdown. Obviously, you know that. That's the TV trope of you know getting it just in time. But it, like I said, it was effectively done, so it wasn't. It yeah. Come off as cheesy to me. Like the, I even mentioned that the you know, the that the you, the other one that they didn't do is that you know a, a wire gets pulled that makes the countdown speed up. They didn't do that one because <laughs> that's it did like you have, up, they though. did the one where they pause it and then it keeps going, but they didn't do the one where it speeds up. So I mean, I think you see that. I mean, because by this point, Terry Nation had been doing TV. I mean, like he did Daleks was that sixty three, and this is like. 16 years later mm -hmm. so he like he really knew his craft by this point so he knew how to tell a simple story well of course and he was getting I mean the first time I saw him good at characterization was um, in uh, Planet of the Daleks I thought he wrote some good, you know, scene, you know with the Thals in Planet of the Daleks. I thought he wrote those quite well. Oh, yeah. That, I, I found this one quite, that quite funny. Raleigh's nickname is Sir Walter. Yeah, I don't get that either. Well, Sir Walter Raleigh. Okay. Well, he discovered the uh potato. I just thought it was funny that they had another name that was similar to. See, so had Cali, and then you have Rally. You know. Ah, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got to say that Terry Nation was a little bit bad with names sometimes. Like <laughs> having two people called Ensor. You got Ensor Senior and Ensor Junior. Well, that. But he never called him Junior. You're picking on that one, but that one does, wasn't really a. That one was fine because it was a father and son, so it made sense. Yeah, but then you got Tarrant uh, and Dell. I think there was a Dell in the first one, wasn't there? In the first episode. Uh, I think that's probably about this. Yeah, Ice Cane. Oh, yeah. Oh, did you notice how when he played? You know when he was supposed to be like a private, he changed his voice, Provine, to sound less posh. I noticed that he changed his voice, but I didn't uh, notice anything about posh because I'm American. Oh, All right, okay. Um, also, that's why I don't get these jokes about like cities or places like Huddersfield or Melton Mowbray because I have no idea what those are. So. Um, and, and you don't have to explain them to me. Uh, no. Sometimes um, I can just say I don't know what something is and, and you can just leave it at that. Okay. Um, yeah, and I suppose the, the thermal clothing is that it, it's not brilliantly effective, so they have to put the heater on as well. I mean, it was very cold, apparently. I think Terry Nation might have been pushing it a bit when he wrote Absolute Zero for the, uh, for the, the polar region. Next. Oh, absolute zero, and they're trying to use mercury scorches? Like, that, that doesn't make any sense. I know. I mean, it's not absolute zero, because the mercury would freeze. Uh, I already thought it was stupid they're yeah. using mercury scorches, because that's like. Even now, that's still like an older bombing mechanism. And now these sci-fi space guys are still using mercury switches? Well, it is of its time. 
Um, okay, move it along. <laughs> right, we've got polar footage with chicken in an oven, right? An ice cano, yeah, you've mentioned that bit. Huh. Oh, I like that one. When Provine was little, it was called Amateur Vine. Yeah. That was cheesy even for me. <laughs> it's lucky Avon and Grant actually knew each other. The scenes where they attempt to defuse the bomb would have been incredibly dull if they'd have been strangers and had to make small talk. Yeah, because Avon doesn't make small talk, so he just would have said nothing. Yeah. Except for what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the second Terry Nation script this season in which a man gets trapped beneath a fallen beam. I think the previous one was Gam. Uh, and, and this is, I think Morgan made this point as well. A teleport bracelet is wasted every time somebody's dropped off at the end of the story. Why doesn't a member of the crew beam down with them and return with both bracelets? Blake grins smugly the curly git. Right, then we've got some it's delightful dialogue. By the monster that eats all of the people that they drop off right after that. They're, they're, the bracelet is sacrificing to the creature you know, that, that's there. They don't send it, then you know, then the creature rises up and kills them all. See, I just wrote, I wrote the underlying uh, hidden story there. Right. Chop. Ooh, we've got here. Both. Yeah. Not yeah. The the means. martial arts. Yeah. yeah right. like, like both of us said, it seemed like it was pretty decent, com especially compared to some of the previous fight scenes. Yeah. I mean, they're always saying, like, oh, you want. Are we about to say something? I just said the fighting was, was much better. Hmm. I mean, it, it, I mean, like they actually. In the beginning, when he, like, I don't know, knife handed guys to the throat. Full of rebel dudes. Right. Uh, it was actually like fast and not like, Hoo! and then a guy just like slowly yeah. Yeah, rolls backward, oh! which is like what all yeah. the other I mean, the actresses complained about not having much to do. Well, maybe if they learned how to fight better, they'd get more yeah. action. The dude, like, who's pretty much the best character now, who's now dead, um, the guy who was <laughs> wrecking everybody. And Provine. He, uh, he just, like, straight up, like, once you, you just straight up shot the dude when he could, you know? Yeah, that was the first thing I mentioned when we started this video was that it makes the whole story better when the bad guy isn't an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was rooting for him the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have had any problem with him taking out Squirrely. <laughs> Win and the Adventures of Pro Line. Yeah. Maybe uh, um, and they'll have the sequel in the afterlife where he hooks up with the chick from that spaceship. The, the... <laughs> what was her name? Sarah. Sarah? Yeah, Sarah. Sarah uh, and Pro Line. Strike Back. Well, I, I won't talk about any possible future characters <laughs> that Morgan may or may not like in future episodes. All right, then. Because Jeff doesn't want any spoilers or teases. Uh, but there might be one that Morgan likes. Right. Uh... So, like, I'm not going to mention any future characters that Morgan might like, but there's one that he might like in the future. <laughs> My face DIY hasn't moved on since the 20th century. 
Raven State of the Art Toolkit is nothing more than a common old garden hand drill painted grey with a whizzy sound effect. There we go. Terminaton Street. Yeah, that's a pun on Coronation Street, which is a British uh, soap. Yeah, Dell and Grant. Uh, Is this comedy book like actually funny over there in Britain or something? Is, or is, is what funny? Is that comedy book actually funny to any of you people? Some of the stuff. Well, it's funny the those... bad episodes, especially. <laughs> yeah, this video seems to be Jeff's kind of humor. But not this video. I mean this uh, this book. Yeah, uh, I, I, the thing, the stuff I actually get that isn't just references to British stuff. I don't know, it's, uh, you know, it's sometimes funny. Like I don't get the last part there. Are they, I mean, they're trying to be funny with that too, because like, the whole deal is that the door is open and then the rocket can like, you know, probably has a thing to turn it so that it blasts off vertically. It says, just how is a rocket lying horizontally in a room just four foot longer than the rocket itself supposed to lift off and exit through the doors far above? Well, the reason is, is the countdown conundrum was a thing on the countdown game show mm -hmm. where it would, it would be like um, so, Scrabble and to show all these letters, right, what word is it? This is the countdown conundrum. Right, so it's supposed to be some puzzle you're supposed to solve. Yeah. So they weren't actually saying that it was like physically impossible or something. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I figured. I was just making sure because I was like, I, I'm not. I'm no um, physics smarty guy, but even I knew how that would work. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it could have just levit. It could have just levitated before the. Uh... Yeah, there's no. There's any number of ways it could have. Oh yeah. I think I think I think they call it repulsor lift in Star Wars. Repulsor lift. That's yeah. Could be a good subtitle for a Star Wars movie. All right, so I think that's pretty much about it. Uh, yeah, we went through the guide entry. Anything else, Jeff? Well, I guess we uh, give our our ratings for the episode. oh oh ratings. Uh. Should I knock a point off for the sets? No. Uh, I'll give it... I mean... Is there anything... Is, is there any way to... I didn't know I was going to stump you by asking for that. I'll give it a 9, I suppose, yeah. Uh, and I'll give it an 8. Oh, I think that might be your highest score ever. I'm pretty sure it is. But, uh, it, you know, it was entertaining for pretty much the whole thing. So, I mean. Is it Morgan's favorite one he's seen? I don't know. He didn't say. Right. Probably is, though. Um, definitely had the, on... He definitely said it was the best character. Provine was the right. best character. Right, so we'll we'll leave it there folks. It's goodbye for me. Alright, see you next time.